Since European settlers arrived in southeast Michigan, almost every square inch of land has been converted from its natural state and is now a virtual food desert for our native butterflies. Without the native plants they depend on, their numbers have dwindled. A lady in Westland, Michigan is doing something about it. In just 10 years, she's transformed her tiny yard into a Shangri-La for butterflies, and it's making a difference. In this neighborhood, occasionally we'd see a cabbage white, and now, in my little backyard, I lost track, but I have over 30 different kinds of butterflies that come to my yard, and now the whole neighborhood is seeing such a diversity of butterflies. You know, it's just amazing. How did she do it? The answer is host plants. We've all seen butterflies sipping on nectar flowers, but without the specific plants they need to feed their larvae, the butterflies are unable to reproduce. Here's a few of the many host plants she raises because native butterflies and moths can't live without them. This here is a spice bush and it's another host plant for the spice bush swallowtails. It's false nettle so you can rub your hands on it and not get stung like with a stinging nettle. Rue's the host plant for black swallowtails and giant swallowtails. Showy tick trifoil and the eastern tail blues lay their eggs on it. This is pearly everlasting and it's a host plant for the American ladies. There's a lot of different species that lay on willows, so I keep the different willows in pots uh, for them to lay their eggs on. I also have hackberry. There's quite a few species that lay on hackberry. Uh, the prickly ash is a host plant for the giant swallowtail. And over there I have the tulip tree and the eastern tiger swallowtail. It lays its eggs on this. Brenda's rule of thumb is go native because that's what the species evolved on. When asked what her main message is for others, Brenda replies, No pesticides. That's the biggest thing is no pesticides. People just want to sp spray and kill every insect they see on their plants. And I tell them, you know, if you plant native plants, they're going to attract the beneficial insects, and they'll do the fighting for you. In addition to creating a beautiful and bountiful safe haven for Lepidoptera in her yard, she also raises them in her kitchen and gives away the eggs to others to raise. Here's a whirlwind tour of some of her babies. And these are the spice bush swallowtails, and when they're little, they're brown. As they get bigger and shed their skin, then they turn green. This is his protection from predators. Mm -hmm. um, they think it's a tree snakes so they won't eat him and right before they make their chrysalis they turn yellow. The chrysalis can either be green or this brownish color. There's two chrysalises there. And here these are eastern tiger swallowtails. When they're little they're brown with a beige saddle and as they shed their skin then they'll end up looking like this and see they also have the little false eye spots. This here is Virginia snake root. The pipe vine swallowtails lay their eggs on this. Pipe, pipe, pipe vine swallowtails. These are my question marks. It's a very active uh, chrysalis. Yeah, it doesn't want it to start eating on it. So it's trying to scare the caterpillar away. Hmm. And these are giant swallowtails. This is North America's largest butterfly. It can have a wingspan of six inches. Oh, that one has his osmotarium out. When they think there's danger, they stick out their osmotarium and it puts out a, a foul scent to scare away a predator. Huh. And these are black swallowtails. That one just shed its skin. It's behind it and its face mask is right here. It hasn't dropped yet. It, makes a silk pad at its abdomen and down here and attaches first and then it takes a spinneret and it makes several strands of silk and once it has its little sling there it ducks its head underneath and leans back in it before it sheds its skin to reveal the crystals. How long ago? I, I don't know it wasn't out when I was just in here. Oh my gosh. So it came out since we've been talking. Cool. So it's, see its wings are still floppy this is a giant silk moth and it's a cecropia and it will spin a cocoon and then pupate within that and it will come out the very end of May or sometime like the middle of June next year. 
This is a hummingbird clear wing. When it's a moth, it looks like a baby hummingbird. Mm -hmm. This is a naked pupa. It doesn't have the cocoon around it. These are my monarchs. That little guy's maybe four days old. This one here is about full grown. Pretty soon it will crawl up to the top and make a silk pad and then it will make its chrysalis. And right before it comes out, it will turn transparent and you'll actually be able to see the monarch in it. How does she feel about all this work? To raising butterflies? For the first time, Brenda is at a loss for words. I find it very easy. In fact, Brenda collaborated with a local nursery to build a greenhouse where plants that support native butterflies are sold. Within the greenhouse, Brenda has native plants and butterflies in all stages of their life cycle, and she's happy to share her joy about butterflies with all who visit. Down in Mexico, there's just millions, and their wings sound like leaves rustling in the wind because there's so many of them. It's just so awesome. Like butterflies, our time on Earth is transitory, but Brenda's work has spread to the multitudes she's inspired and will far outlive her.